Good morning and welcome to our worship today um, as we gather. And so um, just a reminder that uh, on Wednesdays at noon, we continue our series on uh, 2 Corinthians here in July. So come and, and join us at, uh, or join us online there at noon on Wednesdays. Uh, we've kind of decided that it works well when we're outside as we will be on July the 5th. But uh, so as many Sundays as we can uh, during the summer anyway, we're going to be outside for our worship. So come and join us outside, uh, weather permitting. Uh, if the weather does not permit, it rains or is way too hot or something, we will, we will come inside, but uh, be prepared for outside worship uh, as much as possible during the summer. We'll take advantage of uh, God's creation and be out there to join in. But uh, we will also continue to have a uh, service provided at 9.30 for you uh, on, on our webpage and on our Facebook page so that you could join us uh, as well. So. We give thanks for that and for all those who help make that happen. So, um, so with that, we are going to begin with our opening hymn, uh, number 876, Let Whole Creation Cry. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. We continue with our confession and forgiveness. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained this grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let us pray. You are great, O God, and greatly to be praised. 
you have made yourself for us and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you, know you, and serve you. So it's your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue with our readings. First reading is from Zechariah 9, beginning with the ninth verse. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. The second reading is from Romans 7, beginning with verse 15. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want. I agree that the law is good, but in fact it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Our gospel for today is from the Gospel of Matthew in the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus spoke to the crowd, saying, What will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For, God came, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, Look, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to the infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. The Gospel 
praise to you, O Christ. So let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So what is your picture of God? Who is Jesus for you? Now, I'm not asking you what your, you know, what your image of God is, uh, what God looks like, because we don't know what God looks like. And even the way we picture Jesus is not the way Jesus looked like in life. But it's more, who is God for you? How do you see God at work, Jesus at work in the world? What, these are the, the couple of questions that we often seek answers for in life. And maybe even more so in these times of uncertainty, because in these times when life is when life and uh, when life and expectations seem to change with every changing of the hour, we feel like we're we're lacking that solid ground to stand upon. We seek answers to questions. Because we want to know and feel that God is somehow in charge, that God is here, that Jesus is active in our lives and in the world, working for justice and peace and guiding us, helping us to go down that right path. It is in times of uncertainty, this uncertainty of the pandemic, the insecurity throughout our economic situation, the social unrest that we witness, that we are looking for answers of these questions and others. We, all, we often seek strong and decisive leaders, someone to be in charge, to lead us wherever we follow, or, so we feel like we can get things accomplished seeking the conclusions that we want. Yet we don't always listen or don't, we listen or we don't listen to, to the leaders. We listen or don't listen to the president or the vice president or governors or the head of the CDC or Dr. Fauci or the police or the protesters or whoever it is, depending on whether we see that they're credible or not credible. Do we listen? Well, the real problem is we know where we want to be. We know where we want to go. We just don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't know what that ultimate outcome will be. We wonder if the future will look like and take us back to all the things we did in the past. That's what some hope for. Or will our future resemble the past but be very different in the way we work and we play and we interact with others? These are the questions that we ask, but these are not questions that that come to us just because of our time and our place. These are questions that have been asked for generations. Societies have pondered them over the centuries. Even at the time of Jesus, they were wondering about similar questions, especially for the people to who Jesus was speaking and, and the people where Jesus was going, to the Jews at the time, because they were living in an under an occupation of the Roman Empire. For centuries, they had been under the thumb of one oppressive country after another, and they longed for the days of old. They longed for the days of King David. They longed for the stories and the way they heard that things were from the history that they had been told and read. To recreate those days of King David of the past. And it had been ever since the time of King David. They were looking and waiting for the one who was to come, the one who would restore the kingdom of heaven. They were waiting for someone to restore the kingdom as David had it. Messiah would be the one who would save the people of God, to bring the salvation by ushering in the kingdom of heaven on earth. But everyone had a different understanding of what that meant or how it would look or who it would be, what the Messiah would look like or how he would go about doing this task. So it's not, not unusual or not unexpected that um, as we walk all, walk, make our way through the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is talking with his disciples, preparing them to, to be sent out. And, and we're, we've, come through the, we've, we've come through the chapter 10 where Jesus had gone through and, and instructed his disciples. And now he sent them out, and it says at the beginning of chapter 11 that Jesus, too, goes on his way to teach and to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of heaven had come near. And as he does so in the verses prior to our reading, we find out that John the baptizer is in prison. And John the baptizer is hearing all these things that are taking place, all these things that Jesus is doing. And so he sends his followers to Jesus saying, are you the one that we are waiting for or is, or is there going to be another? 
Jesus replies, saying, Go and tell John what you hear and you see. For the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news brought to them. In other words, pay attention to the things that are going on around you. Pay attention to the signs that Jesus is doing because these are the signs that was to tell you that the Messiah had arrived. Then Jesus turns to the people who had gathered to remind them of who John was. He asks them and tells them, why, reminding that John was that prophet, but he was more than a prophet. That John was that voice crying out in the wilderness. That John was sent to proclaim the coming of the Messiah. John was the new Elijah, the one who was going to come, preparing the way for the, the one who was going to be the Savior of the world. In many ways, many ways, Jesus was saying, if you believe John was this new Elijah, this one who was to uh, to be the prelude to the Messiah, then you know who I am. But then we get the start of our lesson, and Jesus seems to be chastising those who had gathered. The crowds that had been around him, saying, "What to what am I going to compare this generation? It is like children sitting in marketplaces calling to one another. We played the flute, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. John came neither eating nor drinking, and you said he had a demon. The Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and you say he is a drunkard. In many ways, he's kind of saying, what do you even know what you want? He's frustrated because the people, they say they know what they want, but they act like they do not know what's going on. They cannot agree on what this Messiah was to do or to be or to look like or what, how are you going to know if he had come. It seems like they wanted him to come, but only if they could come and know that he was going to do the things that he, they wanted him to do. They could kind of keep him in a box, bringing him out only when it was convenient. Jesus responds in a way, he says, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Or, I like it how a different translation put this verse, it said, and wisdom will be vindicated by her actions and not by your opinion. Determining who the Messiah, who the Messiah is, and whether uh, he had come is not going to be decided by any individual or group's opinion, but by the action of the Son of Man in the world. The actions that Jesus took, the actions that Jesus was doing, that said, "This is who he is." Just as he reminded the followers of John, "Look and take notice, for you see." For you see that the, the blind see and the deaf hear and the lame walk and the poor have the good news brought to them. These are the things that show you that God is at work in the world, that Jesus is ushering in the kingdom of heaven on earth, that the Messiah, the Savior, had come. But for us even, we too we are sometimes more like the children in the marketplace. We find ourselves caught up in the problems and the crisis of the world around us. Our default is to try and work it out on our own, to do it ourselves, to bring our God out of our box and let him out to do just what we want and nothing more. We seek to do what is right and good as a way to save our own selves without that consensus of how it's going to be done, how it's going to be accomplished. We, draw the, we, we are drawn back to the law to seek guidance, and then it becomes that burden weighting, that weighting us down drawing us away from God as we seek to accomplish the very thing that we do not want to do. Here, you could say we become the wise and the intelligent in order to find the right path. Here, we turn inward, losing our way, giving away to the very acts that we should not be doing. Or as the words of Paul convicts us, I can will to do what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do what I want, the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. So I find it to be the law that when, it, when I, what I do is what is good, the evil lies close at hand, old wretched one that I am. I'm reminded that everything that we try to do sometimes seems to fail. That the burden becomes heavy. The law becomes a weight, a yoke upon our shoulders. But it's here that the wisdom that has failed us, the burden that has become too great to bear. But then we, as Paul says, thanks be to God in Jesus Christ. He's the one who bids us to come. 
to come and to take his yoke upon us, to share our burdens with him, learning from him that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. That is here that we finally receive the answers to which we seek. That here that we find that the Son will reveal to us the Father. It is here that the picture of our God will be made complete. The actions of our Savior, Jesus, will become known. It is here that we will find rest for our souls. So we are going to sing our hymn number, or hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arm. Living together in trust and hope, we are bold to say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray for the church. Sustain us as we share your word. Embrace us as we struggle to find our common ground. Lift up leaders with powerful and prophetic voices. Free us from stagnant faith. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the well-being of creation. Protect the air, water, and land from abuse and pollution. Free us from apathy in our care of creation and direct us towards sustainable living. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the nations. Guide leaders in developing just policies and guide difficult conversations. Free us from patriotism that hinders relationship building. Lead us to expansive love for our neighbor. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all in need, for all who are tired, feeling despair, sick or oppressed. We remember especially 
Sherry, Karen, David, Peter, Linda, Dennis, Carolyn, Brigada, Mary, Chuck, Ken, Steve, Jerry, Marcy, and Stan. Take their yoke upon you and ease their burdens. Give your consolation and free us from all that keeps us bound. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for this congregation. Bless pastors, deacons, and congregational leaders. Energize children's ministry volunteers, church administrators, and those who maintain our building. Shine in this place that we might notice the ways your love transforms our lives. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So I invite you to join together in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with some special music this day.
though neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love which is in Christ, in God, in Christ Jesus our Lord, from God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Live in God's peace. Christ is with you. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.